Hello and welcome to Marks and Clark's webinar on the UK Supreme Court's recent decision in Unwired Planet and Huawei and Huawei and ZTE the Conversant. Uh, we are going to have, I hope, a lively discussion today. I'm going to start first with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if we could go to the second slide. What you should be able to see on your screen is a box uh, on the right hand side with a little control panel and the important thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that there is a section in that box for questions and if you would like to send any any questions to uh, to us uh, please do so enter it in the box click send and we will do our very best to make sure that we cover all the questions uh, during this session. Uh, what we are going to do is we're going to divide the webinar into a first section where we uh, briefly describe the key issues that were decided by the Supreme Court and we will then have a second part which will be more of a discussion of what we see to be the key issues. So let me now introduce our panel. I'm joined by three of my colleagues. Uh, Daffith Bevan, Will Jensen, and John Derone Truber. Uh, Daffith is a partner specializing in patent litigation in the high tech sector. He has advised a number of clients on friend and set litigation, arbitration, and licensing, as well as working closely with our patent attorney teams on validity and essentiality reviews in the context of licensing negotiations and disputes. Will has been almost continuously involved in telecoms and FRAN litigation since 2008, when he worked on some of the first Nokia v IPCOM cases. He regularly advises on both technical and FRAN aspects of telecoms litigation. John has acted on many high-tech disputes involving MP patent holders. More significantly for today, he has advised on challenges to UK jurisdiction following the initial decision that the UK courts could determine global FRAND license terms. So I will now turn over to Daffith, who will introduce the Supreme Court decision. Well, thanks very much, Graham. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background to um, what the Supreme Court had to decide, um, the case arose from two conjoined appeals in um, to the Supreme Court. One. Uh, from the case of unwired planet and huawei and the other from the huawei zte um, against conversant uh, case on the unwired planet side uh, unwired planet planet uh, is a patent assertion entity and has acquired a large portfolio of patents including seps from ericsson in 2013. Um, unwired planet sued google samsung and huawei in 2014 for infringement um, on the basis that uh, the parties had failed to um, agree a FRAND license, and so they were seeking an injunction um, as, as a remedy. Um, Google settled early and entered into a settlement agreement with, um, with Unwired Planet. Samsung settled after the technical trial, and it's worth pausing there just to say that in the UK, um, the, uh, the, there are effectively two trials um, in, in any patent infringement matter, including in FRAND, trial, FRAND matters, where Typically, the, um, the technical issues of, of infringement and validity are assessed at a first um, trial, usually referred to as a technical trial. And remedies such as damages and, in the case of uh, FRAN proceedings, FRAN royalties are assessed in the second trial. Um, so Samsung um, settled after um, a finding of uh, infringement of a valid patent in the technical trial, but Huawei um, carried on. Um, and um, was unsuccessful at first instance and at the Court of Appeal, um, and now appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, Unwired Planet argued that um, in order to be uh, FRAND compliant, the license, um, any license that Huawei, Huawei took from them, would um, need to be on a global worldwide basis. Um, Huawei, on the other hand, were arguing that um, a license should be taken on a country by country basis. So in order to avoid an injunction in the UK, all they needed to do was to take a national UK license. 
Um, so that's that's where we got to in advance of the Supreme Court case, um, case on the unwired planets Huawei side. As I mentioned, there was a second case that was um, conjoined with that one, which was um, Conversant having sued Huawei and ZTE, um, seeking a declaration that um, an offer that they had made to license their standard essential patents was frowned. Um, in that case, uh, there was a jurisdiction challenge and it was the appeal to that jurisdiction challenge that was heard by the Supreme Court. So those two cases were heard together. And what we're gonna do um, in, in this talk is to take each question that the court had to decide in turn. So I'm gonna take a look at the first one um, and then I'll hand over to Will and John to um, consider the, the next few questions. So as I mentioned, Unwired Planet um, was arguing that um, in order to avoid an injunction in the UK courts, um, Huawei had to take a global worldwide portfolio license um, from them uh, in order to be, uh, for that license to, to constitute a frowned license. Um, and Huawei on the other hand were arguing that no, if they were to take a national license that would be sufficient to constitute a frowned license and uh, the court could not grant an injunction if they were prepared to, to take a national license which they said was frowned. And so the question for the court was, can the court grant an injunction to restrain infringement of a UK SEP if an infringer refuses to enter into a global portfolio license, including patents from multiple countries, on FRAND terms? And the simple answer is yes, they can. So Unwired Planet had successfully argued at first instance um, that a willing licensor and a willing licensee, so these are sort of real world um, uh, notional licensors and licensees, uh, in those, those willing licensors and licensees finding themselves in the circumstance of this case would negotiate a worldwide license um, of an SEP patent for, portfolio rather than seeking to negotiate a country by country license. And the Supreme Court agreed. Um, so given that, that, that there was a finding of fact that the, the likely license that a willing licensor and licensee would take would be a um, global license, the question was then, well, if they don't take that license, does the court have jurisdiction to, to um, give that license? And the court took a look at the, um, the contractual provisions buried in the ETSI intellectual property rights policy, ETSI being the standard setting organization for the, for the patents in question. And they found that those contractual provisions were the, at the time of declaration, when a, a an SEP holder declares their patents essential to the standard, um, the courts found that those provisions um, were um, enforceable by the court. And so where, where the declaration is made and in return, the, um, the SEP holder agrees to take a license on brand terms, um, that was a contractually enforceable provision in UK law. So then the question was, um, if the court is going to give effect to that contractual provision, what does it do? And the court decided that it would it would indeed grant an injunction if um, the the um, implementer was not prepared to take um, a, a license on FRAN terms, which it had assessed was on a global basis. So the question then arises: you know, it sounds a little bit like a power grab by the UK courts. Um, and I know there's been a lot of commentary internationally um, suggesting that the UK courts are uh, uh, trespassing on the jurisdiction of, of, of other courts. So it's important to, to, to stress what the court was doing here. What it's doing is um, it's not seeking to extend its own jurisdiction to assess validity and infringement of foreign patents, but just assess the terms of what a willing licensor and licensee would enter into in terms of a FRAND license and put that as the alternative to an injunction covering UK SEPs. So the only consequence, and it may be a significant consequence, but the only consequence of the implementer refusing to take a, um, a global FRAND license is an injunction in respect of valid and infringed UK standard essential patents. The UK court is not seeking to, um, to enter into a, a discussion of the validity or infringement of foreign patents. 
Um, another point to note is that the court was was determining the issue for this case only. So, so it was a question of fact whether the license that the um, the implementer should take was a global license. That was a question of fact for this case. Um, and it is possible to imagine in the future that a, a, a court in a similar position would, would look at the situation of the particular parties in front of it and decide actually um, a global license is not appropriate in this case because that's not what a willing licensor and licensee in the position of these um, uh, parties would do at that stage. Um, an associated point that came up in the court was um, that Huawei argued, um, and they hadn't argued in the lower courts, but Huawei had argued that what the court should impose was not an injunction. This was all a question, they said, of royalties and whether or not, um, it, not whether or not uh, they, they were entitled to practice the, um, the, the inventions of the patent, but in fact, how much they should pay. And so they said the appropriate remedy in that case, even though the usual remedy is in the UK courts for infringement is an injunction, they said that um, uh, the appropriate remedy here was to give damages in lieu of an injunction um, and, and that that would, would satisfy the needs of justice. The court uh, listened to that argument but refused. They said, well, you know, the standard, a standard um, basis and the standard remedy for infringement of a patent is uh, to grant an injunction. And if we don't grant one in this case, then there is no incentive on the implementer to enter into good faith negotiations in advance of um, going all the way to the end of all appeals in, um, in the court process, because all they know that they will know that the only thing that they can suffer at the end of that is an imposed um, amount of damages that's equal to to a license um, that the royalty they would pay under any license. So the court said that in order to maintain that incentive, they would um, persist and grant an injunction um, if the implementer did not um, agree to take a global license um, in this case, um, which was which was what they assessed was around. Um, so I'm going to pass over to John now to, to talk about the uh, next issue that came up. So, uh, um, came up in front of the court. Uh, then Will's going to talk about some other issues, then we'll have a bit of a discussion at the end. So John. Thank you, Daffid. Um, yeah, so Daffid has dealt with the all important global license point there, which um, is, is clearly the most significant issue that's arisen from the Supreme Court judgment. But um, Will and I are going to take you through a few of the other points, because no doubt these will play a role in the future litigation in the UK and, and how that ends up being determined. Um, so this this first point, if, if Daffid has told you about how the UK court has decided that the uh, UK had jurisdiction to determine the global license, this second point went to whether the UK was in fact the correct place to, to make that decision as against another jurisdiction, and in this case it was China. Um, this point arose from the separate conversant and Huawei ZTE proceedings, which Daffid has mentioned was, was part of this and joined for the Supreme Court decision. Um, Huawei and ZTE had made this argument because of the, the vast differential between the markets in the UK and China, as you can see in that table there. Um, to, to cut to the end of this, essentially the, the challenge, the, the forum convenience challenge as it's called, failed. And um, the reason it did was that uh, the, the UK court found that um, Huawei and ZTE had not actually suggested a suitable alternative forum. So there was no way that the UK court could stay its proceedings and um, let, in this case, China continue. Um, the reason that the Supreme Court said this is because, as, as I've uh, quoted there, that um, on the evidence that the Chinese courts do not at present have jurisdiction to determine a global friend license, at least in the absence of agreement by all parties, and um, Conversant had not agreed here. And indeed, um, the evidence that was put before the courts suggested that even if um, the uh, even if uh, the Chinese court decided 
to proceed because, of, well, sorry, even if Conversant had agreed, the um, Chinese courts may still not. It may be speculative that they would actually decide a global license. Um, so with, with the failure of the attempt to permanently stay or permanently stop the UK proceedings in favour of China, there was a secondary issue, um, which was whether at least so, oh, sorry, Duffet, back on the first slide. Thank you. Um, uh, whether the um, UK court should at least delay its proceedings so that the um, Chinese proceedings could conclude and they could be factored into um, any UK decision on, on global brand terms. Um, the answer here was no. Um, there were different issues, and it's important to say that the um, the, the issue here in China was Chinese SEPs only. Um, so uh, different issues, it was a UK SEP um, and uh, that was being enforced in, in the UK. And also it was noted that Conversant's um, portfolio was quite old and any further delays would um, have an adverse commercial effect on, on its um, business. Um, it should be noted as well that the, the UK court had tried to introduce some levels of delay to assist with the Chinese proceedings concluding, but um, they, the, the, the point here was that no further delays were required. So um, with, with this one sort of coming to an end quite abruptly with a fundamental point not being proven, being whether there was an alternative forum, um, the Supreme Court still did give a few indications on what would happen if a suitable alternative forum had been identified. And this is likely to, to happen in the future as other courts suggest they will term in global terms. And um, so one, one of the key things that needs to be deter determined for a, a, a challenge to jurisdiction in this way is the court needs to un like analyze the, the, the dispute before the parties to decide where's the right place to decide that dispute. So this is called the, the matter to be tried. Um, here, it was determined that that matter to be tried was the enforcement of UK SEPs with the friend license, the global friend license issue arising as part of a contractual defense from the um, Etsy undertaking. Um, that's, that contrasts with what Huawei and ZTE tried to argue, which was this was purely uh, an argument over global front terms. Um, so it, it's good to know where the, where the Supreme Court and so the lower courts will come down on this issue in future challenges. Separately, um, the Supreme Court did mention, but did not offer any particular analysis on um, the key considerations that would come up in a future um, forum convenience challenge. They're at paragraph 98 of the judgment. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of those decisions, but just to, to sum up, I will say um, it's it's based on European law. It suggests for the most part that the UK would still accept jurisdiction and continue its proceedings, but there are a few arguments which might go the other way. So, um, Duffet, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so. The next um, point which I'm going to talk about is uh, whether, and this is back to the Unwired Planet appeal, um, is the um, what, what essentially does non-discrimination, non-discriminatory mean in the FRAND obligation. <laughs> um, this arose from a, an argument that Samsung, who had concluded a license with Unwired Planet, had got more favourable terms then the UK court was um, had determined for Huawei. And um, Huawei said that they were similarly situated. It was essentially discriminatory and had not taken into account this non-discriminatory obligation as part of FRAND. So Huawei were taking what had been de defined by the lower courts as a hard-edged approach. Um, this essentially you know, you, you'll hear this referred to as well as a um, most favorable license terms approach or, and it's it to sum it up, it means once a SEP holder offers a certain set of terms and in particular royalty rate to one licensee, then all similarly situated licensees should get the same or better terms in future negotiations. Um, it does require that the non-discriminatory element is considered on its own as one separate obligation to fair and reasonable, which may or may not be joined on, on in their own right. Um, 
the Supreme Court did agree that uh, Huawei and Samsung were um, similarly situated licensees, but they did not agree that um, it was a hard-edged obligation. They preferred the decision of the lower courts, which was that there was a general non-discriminatory obligation, which essentially means fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory have to be read all together as one obligation. <clears throat> and um, from that, you determine uh, the, the set of terms and it allows for variation. As, as the UK court has said, and I've included some of the quotes on the slide there, it was the the, uh, the in applying the FRAND obligation should reflect the true value of the sets to which the license relates without adjustment depending upon the national, so the individual characteristics of a particular market participant. And they summed it up as saying a single royalty price list available to all, which is something interesting and there will be a lot of debate over I think in the future. Um, so in coming to this conclusion, um, the, the Supreme Court also drew on evidence from Etsy themselves, who it turned out had removed a most favorable license clause from their original 1993 draft of um, the IPR policy. I'm not, I'm not gonna read it out, but you can see there what that, that clause said. And um, by 1994, it had been removed. So um, it did suggest to the, to the UK court, and it has in the past to at least the US court, um, in, an, in a separate um, set of proceedings that um, Etsy never intended for this hard-edged approach to non-discriminatory obligations. Um, so why did Samsung end up with such a good deal if they were similarly situated licensees? Uh, the key here, and this was emphasised across all courts, is to that you must look at the specific economic circumstances applicable to the negotiations of each licence before you decide that they are, are suitable comparators and you can just take one and say that those terms should be in the other. Um, in the case of Samsung, they had settled at an early stage in these proceedings. Um, they had done it at a time when uh, Unwired Planet were in financial trouble and they had also done it at a time when Unwired Planet wanted licensees to say that their portfolio, that they, you know, they had a, a useful portfolio that was worthy of licensing. Um, so they had many reasons to take Samsung's, uh, to get Samsung as a licensee, and Samsung as a result had um, a, a lot of power in the negotiations. So this is why it could not be compared with the, um, the FRAN terms set by the court for Huawei. Um, the, the Supreme Court thought that this approach reflected commercial reality and sense. It, it allowed various practices which happen quite a lot to to continue so for set holders to uh, to um uh, use first mover advantage which was for example what happened with samsung and indeed fire sales um where they just reduce reduce will, will offer lower royalties so that um they can uh, generate income um there, there are various other commercial reasons that would come into play and it just shows again the supreme court trying to um think in the real world of what will happen in negotiations and, and what might apply. Um, it was noted that if, if the uh, Supreme Court had come to a different conclusion, none of these options would be available to SEP holders and the likelihood is that um, uh, implementers would hold out because they would wait for someone else to take the license at what would be the highest bar that would apply on royalties. So uh, I'll now hand over to Will for the next point. Thank you, John. Um, the fourth issue the court decided on related to whether Unwired Planet could seek an injunction, i.e. Huawei's FRAN defence, and how the party should conduct themselves in negotiations and in doing so, the court looked to whether the Huawei, Huawei ZTE framework of the court of, um, of the CJEU uh, was mandatory. Now, it probably helps to remind us of the history of this aspect of the decision. The, um, the Huawei ZTE framework was um, uh, was a decision of the CJU handed down in 2015. It was a referral from uh, the German courts in a matter where Huawei was, in that instance, a SEP holder. And the central question of the referring court was whether Huawei's request for an injunction was an abuse of its dominant position under Article 102 of the TFEU, bearing in mind the party's behaviour in negotiating. 
the decision spelled out a number of steps the party should follow, which particularly became known as the um, the Fran dance. Um, in the UK, Huawei had argued that because Unwired Planet did not follow these steps, it should be denied an injunction because it had abused its dominant position. And the question in front of the UK court was whether these were mandatory steps that must be followed for a SEP holder to avoid a finding that it had abused its dominant position. If you could pop the next slide on, please, Daphne. The answer is no. The Supreme Court found only one of those steps to be mandatory. The others were not mandatory, but if, a, if followed, they offered a safe harbour to the SEP holder. Um, that's just not to say that failure to follow them does not necessarily mean that Article 102 is infringed, because it all depends on the circumstances of the particular case. Um, of the Huawei ZTE framework, the one mandatory step was found to be the requirement for the SEP holder to give notice um, or consult with the implementer before bringing proceedings. Um, that requirement was set out in paragraph 60 of Huawei ZTE, set out on the slide there. The proprietor of the SEP cannot, without infringing Article 102, bring an action for an injunction without notice or prior consultation with the alleged infringer, even if the SEP has already been used by the alleged infringer. The Supreme Court agreed with the lower court's decisions on this point and found that the CJU scheme is a standard of behaviour against which both parties' behaviour can be measured to decide if in all the circumstances an abuse has taken place, rather than imposing mandatory requirements which had to be complied with in all cases. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the court went on to look at what the nature of the notice or prior consultation should be to allow the SEP holder to avoid a finding of an abuse of dominant position. And as the court found, the notice or prior consultation is mandatory. The nature of the notice required will depend on the circumstances of the case. And in deciding what the circumstances are, account should be taken of the specific legal and factual circumstances. Um, and of course, this issue may arise in a wide variety of factual situations, which will be dependent on the technology and the use of the, of the set. Um, the court was also quick to point out that different legal systems will provide different procedural contexts. Uh, by way of example, in Germany, an injunction could be obtained before validity is determined. In applying these, uh, in applying the, uh, the procedure to the facts of, of this case, the Supreme Court agreed with the lower court's findings that Unwired Planet had not abused its dominant position. Um, Huawei had had sufficient notice prior to the proceedings being launched in March 2014. It was clear that the proceedings did not represent a refusal to license on Unwired Planet's plant. Um, Huawei knew that Unwired Planet wanted to license it and that Unwired Planet and would accept um, whatever license was, in fact, franned. The issue of proceedings did not prevent the parties from negotiating. And in fact, Unwired Planet provided key terms after commencing proceedings, but Huawei had never made an unqualified offer to accept whatever were, were in fact, franned terms. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what practical steps can we take from this? So we've set out here a few practical pointers, but um, I have to caveat these. that These are all, of course, dependent on the facts of the situation. Um, but overall, the judgment does underline the importance of following normal commercial practice and simply making it clear that you're a willing licensee or, or license or. Um, so the, the first take home message is that you can follow the Huawei ZTE steps which provide a, a safe harbour um, to, uh, to allow you to, to, to take advantage of, 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 um, of an injunction if you're a SEP holder. The SEP holders um, who have an intention to license an implementer and avoiding, avoid a finding of abuse of a dominant position so that injunction threat is not neutralised, um, they should be giving notice to the implementer of infringement and a wish to license the SEP patent on FRAN terms. Um, we suggest perhaps giving bare details of infringement and setting a reasonable deadline for the uh, uh, for the um, uh, for the implementer to respond. Um, this should be followed by consultation with the implementer and frand offers, 
uh, under cover of an NDA if necessary. If proceedings are not avoidable, um, it should be made clear that those proceedings are not an end to the negotiations and that the court's frank determination will be accepted. The implementer, with an intention to obtain a license on FRAN terms or avoid an injunction, should engage with the process and make a FRAN counteroffer. If proceedings are commenced, employ the FRAN defence, but make it clear that the court's FRAN determination will be accepted. We have um, set out in this slide a summary of the bare minimum the parties negotiation might want to consider. Um, but in reality, as I mentioned before, they will, um, of course, depend on the, the legal and factual circumstances. Um, but I think it, it is fair to say as a general conclusion that to take advantage of the Huawei ZT framework, the parties have to conduct themselves as either a willing licensee or willing licensor. Now I'm going to hand back over to Graham uh, so he can start our um, our discussion panel. Well, well thank you, uh, Will and John and David for that introduction. Uh, we'll now move on to the discussion part of the webinar. Uh, my, my first observation is uh, the key message that everyone uh, now knows from the UK Supreme Court decision is yes, the UK courts will think it acceptable and correct to decide what global FRAND licenses uh, will contain as in their royalty rates and their terms in order to decide whether or not uh, the parties to these negotiations have behaved in accordance with the FRAND undertaking that a standard essential patent holder must give to EPSI. Uh, but what this decision does not say is, and these are the terms that will always apply to a FRAND license. Uh, it, I think it must be remembered that what is or is not FRAND uh, in terms of the, the actual license terms uh, will remain to be uh, debated and negotiated and argued over in, in all future cases. And uh, with, with that in mind, uh, I'll ask David first, um, you know, what factors will be considered by the UK courts uh, when setting the royalty rates in a global FRAND license? Just unmute myself. Um, thanks, Graham. I, I think um, it's worth saying that, that throughout this throughout this case, the Supreme Court um, and, and the Court of Appeal, in fact, on, on this aspect, really agreed with um, what Mr Justice Burse had decided at first instance. And what he outlined was, uh, and it's worth saying also, that um, this the section of the, the judgment and indeed the proceedings themselves on this issue was, was actually the, the point that took most of the time of the of the court to establish uh, and a lot of expert evidence on on both sides so as you say this is very much a uh, a case by case assessment but broadly speaking mr justice burst um in his his outline um set out two two different um approaches that could be taken to um set the royalty rates um he preferred um one in particular which was to look at comparable licenses um, and, and use those as a basis to um, set the royalty rates. He then um, discussed a second um, approach, which was um, what's referred to generally as the top-down approach. Um, uh, and, but he, he stressed that that was really, in his view, to be used as a cross-check um, uh, to check that your, the, the conclusion of your review from looking at comparable licenses uh, was appropriate. Um, and so, on the face of it, looking at comparable licenses sounds fairly simple. You just look at other licenses entered into in the same um, in the same field and and um, examine what um, what terms a willing licensor and willing licensee in in these particular circumstances might enter into. Of course, that entirely begs the question: um, Are these appropriate um, comparable licenses? Um, do uh, are the parties to to the comparable licenses in a similar situation to uh, those in the um, in the license that you're trying to settle at the time? Um, are they both in the same in in a similar position? And so, effectively, there's an exercise that the court will do to unpick comparable licenses and look at 
particular factors, for example, the um, economic position of the, um, the parties when they entered into the uh, license, they will look at um, the, comp the, the relative value of the portfolios being licensed. So um, on the one hand, um, for example, in this case, but one of the comparable licenses was, um, as I mentioned, the patent portfolio was originally owned by Ericsson and had been sold to Unwired Planet. So some of the licenses they looked at in terms of comparable licenses was to look at some licenses that Ericsson had entered into previously. Um, but they did have to then assess um, the relative value of the two portfolios because, because Ericsson had a much larger portfolio um, uh, and Wired Planet had only taken a subset of that. Um, so that that's in going through this exercise, they will um, look carefully at the relative values. Another step they need to take is to um, apply a factor to the patent portfolio to take into account um, any over declarations of standard essential patents, because the, the the stage in the development of the standard at which these um, the patents are declared essential. Is very early on and so there's a tendency by by um, set holders to over declare their their patents so again um, when you're looking and comparing one license with another you you also have to look at factors such as um, the propensity of a particular um, set holder to to um, declare their patents essential and maybe um, scale down um, the, the number of relevant um, standard essential patents that you're looking at on the basis of that assessment. So that's a very high level view. And I think the only real way of, of, um, of getting a feel for exactly how the, the, the court approaches the, um, the task is to look both at, um, to a certain extent, the Supreme Court decision, but but very much the the first instance decision of um, Mr. S Justice Burse, uh, which sets out in great detail the uh, competing positions of the experts on both sides in terms of um, in terms of um, carrying out that comparison exercise between the the license that we're trying to settle at the moment and com comparable licenses. So then I mentioned that that Mr. Justice Burse had also um, described a top-down approach a, by way of a sort of confirmation of, of the number that comes out at, at, at the end of the exercise in, in comparable licenses. Um, what that involves is establishing a what's referred to as a sort of aggregate, aggregate royalty burden, meaning the total royalty um, payable for all patents in respect of a particular product or uh, in respect of a, uh, a, a particular um, uh, product that, that that's licensed under the uh, under the SEPs, um, and you then divide that total aggregate burden amongst all of the um, licensors who who whose SEPs have contributed to the um, licensed product, um, and so Mr. Justice Burst thought that that was a fairly imperfect way of doing it, but did serve as a as a, a useful cross check to to um, establish whether or not your the figure established as a basis of the comparable licenses was um, was in the right ballpark uh, uh, and uh, and a kind of sanity check to that to that assessment. So a long answer, I'm afraid. Um, and the, the the basic uh, the basic point is that that there's a lot of um, detailed um, factoring down of of uh, license and royalty numbers from other licenses that are then factored into um the 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 process to come in come to a calculation of a final figure to include in the in the royalty that um that is assessed uh, for the particular license that you're settling uh, and presumably one uh, aspect of the uk procedure that helps with this is that uh, and unlike perhaps most other jurisdictions other than the united states the uk courts have wide powers to order disclosure or discovery of relevant materials from the parties, uh, meaning that when you need to look at comparable licenses, uh, there is a mechanism for forcing a party to provide disclosure of those terms. Uh, that said, the, the UK courts are, of course, also very uh, aware of the confidentiality issues, which would need to be balanced. Uh, 
the, the fact remains that disclosure is routinely ordered, which, which could be very useful for the parties here. Um, that, that, that's right. One, one, one point just to add to that is, is that, of course, um, there, is, there is also provision in, in UK disclosure to order disclosure pre-action, so not as part of, necessarily as part of um, ongoing litigation, but there's, there's, there's case law outside the um, standard essential patent field that um, uh, points to the ability of the courts to order um, a potential adverse party to disclose um, some uh, pre-existing contracts to help with the assessment of, of, of royalties uh, that need to be assessed. That was in the context of a, of a non-practicing entity um, seeking to license uh, its patents, but but I think the same principle would apply if you were if you were approaching a license negotiation in in the SEP field. It could certainly be useful. Um, well, I'll, I'll turn to Will now and ask: um, uh, When we look at this decision from the Supreme Court, is this now um, a decision that means that friend negotiations on a national basis, as opposed to a global one, uh, are going to be impossible? Uh, in the, you know, could there still be cases where implementers say that a true friend approach requires a grant of a national license, not a global one? Um, thanks, Graham. I, I, I think it would be very surprising if that was the result, if, if uh, it was not possible to negotiate a, a national friend license in the future based on this decision. Um, it is clear that the context of the FRAN disputes we've seen so far, the global portfolios, <clears throat> global licenses, global players. Um, and it makes sense in those circumstances for the courts to settle a global license, as we've seen, because that is the, the standard commercial practice. Um, but if there was, by way of example, um, an implementer who only intended, um, or maybe was only able to use a step or a number of steps in a single jurisdiction, um, I mean, by the example, a chipset to be installed in a, in, a, in, a, in a train door that was only ever intended to be used in the UK. Um, in that situation, a global license would surely not be the, uh, would be in fact the, the front. Um, but I think the methodology set out by the court could allow for this by simply basing royalty calculations on the patents within that jurisdiction. Um, and uh, I, I think it's probably worth also pointing out that this could be a question that does become more relevant as more and more IoT devices come on stream because it's far easier to imagine a, a device in that context that is to be limited to one jurisdiction rather than telecoms patents which or telecoms devices which are designed to interoperate across borders and even be carried over borders um, by their users. Um, um, I, yes, I think, uh, to, in short, to answer to your question, I think it, 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 it certainly is possible for a friend license in, in the future to be on a national basis. We we'll just have to wait to the, the right factual and legal circumstances for that to arise. So it sounds like it's, it's very fact specific. And uh, what one option which the Supreme Court has expressly provided for in, in its judgment is a possibility that uh, it, it, it's a kind of hybrid option which acknowledges that maybe when negotiating global license terms there is one jurisdiction uh, that is of uh, far more importance uh, than the rest of the world and you could easily see this for example with um, an implementer who was manufacturing smartphones in China uh, or other products in China, which may be shipped to other parts of the world, uh, but the China market might account for a great deal of its business. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, has expressly suggested that it might be appropriate that the brand license terms should allow for that particular jurisdiction uh, to have royalty rates and license terms that can be amended to take into account decisions in the local courts regarding the validity, essentiality, or infringement of the relevant national patents, and that uh, the, the license could therefore be adjusted as time goes by to reflect uh, the, the, what the conditions in that particular jurisdiction. 
and that could be a very useful uh, tactic for an implementer if faced by a standard central patent holder saying you must agree a global license term to say ah yes but you still need to carve out uh, specific terms for this key jurisdiction uh, such as china or possibly the united states could could be another one in different circumstances uh, now if, if i turn to john uh, you know, that's uh, one suggestion as to how implementers might uh, be able to respond to this decision. Uh, what, what do you see as being the key uh, messages for implementers uh, when faced with the threat of UK proceedings now in, in SEP patent litigation? Thanks, Graeme. Um, so, well, I'm a UK lawyer for a start, so I would say that if an implementer finds themselves in UK litigation, one big option I'd be recommending is embrace the, the benefits of the UK system. Um, you know, we've got specialist technical judges and lawyers and our decisions at a technical level for just deciding on patent essentiality and validity will be heavily driven by experts in the field and at the evidence from them. So it, it to, to, to put it simply, um, a, 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 a SEP holders portfolio that is is in fact weak and that's the view of the implementer um it it will fail if uh once the uk court looks at it um th th this can only be good um going back to what you were just talking about um the the uk court's taking a, a very commercial approach to all of this and um it's it's willing to build in mechanisms into the global friend license so that includes uh, as you were saying um accounting for the terms that are set by other jurisdictions um in particular as well any um invalidity um and invalidation of um the SEPs in key jurisdictions and and all of this will help to give and implement a certainty in the terms that are being set. It, it, it could end up with a with a set of terms that it likes and the set holder doesn't. Um, so, but be, so aside from my UK potential UK bias, I'm looking at it for an implementer who who does choose to to look at ways of leaving the, the UK jurisdiction. Um, they can go back to challenging that jurisdiction. Um, I, I talked about what happened with Huawei and ZTE and how their forum convenience argument failed on a on a pretty fundamental level. Um, there's there's more questions there that need to be answered by the courts and and it may be that a future forum convenience challenge um, actually uh, succeeds. Um, if this was something that an implementer was looking at, I would um, be recommending that they they consider starting proceedings in their preferred jurisdiction to have that suitable alternative forum and, and indeed try to get some kind of ruling from them that they are willing to consider global friend terms. Um, the, the, the last uh, option in, in this kind of camp that is, is the one that it would be really unfortunate and um, you know, hopefully can be avoided, but it's the very extreme one, which is that the the UK's position on all of this can be accepted and the implementer may choose to leave the UK market, just accepting the injunction in relation to the UK SEPs. Because as as we've talked about here, the, the, the key point of this decision is that the UK is only saying, take these global friend terms or you are injuncted in the UK. Um, so, they, the, the front terms can be ignored and um, then the input can just stop its activities in the UK. Um, there's a few aspects to this to consider. If, if the UK market was never that important for the particular implementer, it may have very, very small sales. And, you know, this can work in its favour for suggesting that nothing else should happen in the UK. It would be disproportionate given the costs of litigation. And that's the end of the matter. But unfortunately, that implementer is now no longer on the UK market. Um, if they had more substantial sales in the past, things get a bit trickier. Um, they will potentially um, face uh, a, a friend trial anyway, because um, it, we're seeing from other cases in the UK that the SEP holder may not be willing to agree uh, a figure for those substantial past sales. And where that happens, 
um, the UK court will have to make some kind of determination on damages on, 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 these, on this compensation and um, to do so they may use a hypothetical friend license. So um, even, even that implement of trying to get out the UK may still find themselves participating in a friend trial. Um, so I th yeah, the, 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 other, the other thing I would like to say on this though is uh, looking at it from the other side for, for implementers, um, their options with the UK, they, they may choose to start proceedings in the UK now as well to seek that global friend license. Um, they are, you, you know, they, they, they may be stuck in, in negotiations with a SEP holder who's potentially holding out and, you know, the, the, this decision of the UK court has left them in a position where they can they can point to it and say we will we will get certainty on this and we will determine front terms on a global basis and um, it's something that may help push along the proceed the, the the negotiations with the input with the SEP holder or indeed it may be that they just end up in court and the UK makes the decision. Thank you, John. And uh, as I mean, one thing that sound, seems clear from that is the potential for parallel proceedings in different jurisdictions. And uh, one important point on that is the possibility of anti-suit injunctions, uh, where you commence proceedings in one jurisdiction, which you believe is the natural forum for hearing the dispute, and ask that court to rule that uh, the party should not proceed in proceedings in another jurisdiction. Uh, and although we don't have a huge amount of information, uh, it certainly appears to be the case that the Chinese courts are now showing their willingness to grant anti-suit injunctions, uh, in this case to prevent enforcement in, in Germany. Uh, we have not seen that uh, as against this UK decision, uh, but it, it means that uh, in any global dispute it's going to be very important to uh, have a full litigation strategy um, covering all, all applicable jurisdictions. Um, my, my next... I was just going to add to that, Graham, just to say that um, it, it still seems that um, you know, given the amount that the courts all cross refer to each other's decisions, a, an overall multinational litigation strategy seems for, for both sides, both implementers and set holders alike, um, to be one that does achieve um, um, good results. And the, it, for the moment, at least, will probably stay the, the preferred option. Indeed. Okay, my, my next question for the panel is uh, to come back to uh, the issue of validity and infringement uh, in that this case is all about you know, the key point of settling global friend license terms, uh, but is it still the case for the UK before you can uh, ask a court to decide whether a, flat, a license terms are friend or not friend? that a patentee must show that it, there is at least one patent that is valid and infringed? Or, or is it going to be possible to jump straight to uh, license term um, analysis? Who would like to take that? Um, I mean, I think um, it's certainly the, the, the basis of, of, of the jurisdiction in the UK to grant an injunction is indeed to find a um, valid and infringed patent. So, so the court certainly couldn't grant an injunction um, to prevent uh, uh, an implementer from, from using the, um, the invention of a particular patent uh, without having gone through a technical trial. There was, however, some discussion in a recent case, in, in the case management uh, stage of a recent case uh, of um, TQ Delta and Zyxel, uh, where the um, the judge in that case, uh, uh, Mr. Henry Carr, did observe that it may well be that the, the question at issue between the parties is not whether or not there should be a friend license at all, but whether uh, but but the terms of that license. So that both parties effectively accept that a license is needed because um, you have to remember that obviously these portfolios are very large numbers of of standard essential patents. The likelihood of finding um, a valid infringed patent somewhere in that portfolio is is quite high, and so the parties may well um, uh, may well accept that a license is needed. Um, and and what uh, Mr. Carr said 
in in that case was was if that if that is in fact the position it may well be preferable to proceed directly to um a friend the assessment of the friend um uh royalties and 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 um and, and terms and uh and issue a sort of declaration from the court that this is what would be friend and that the parties can then go away and, and license on those terms um, it's not it it hasn't actually um gone all the way through and and been um carried out in practice in the uk and you can imagine there may be some problems with that because it does perhaps to a certain extent put the implementer in a in a favorable position because they can go through a whole fran trial and then decide later potentially that they do in fact want to um challenge the jurisdiction of the court to give an injunction um and and refuse to to to, to enter into the the license as 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 settled by the court um and, and at that stage a technical trial would be needed so that, that there would need to be a bit of um uh creative case management by the courts uh to to enable that to happen but they have shown themselves to be quite creative in the way that they approach these matters to try and mirror the real world scenario so i, I suspect that in future if that um position presents itself, it may well be that um, the courts uh, agree to it. Thank you. Um, keeping an eye on the time, I think there's time for just one last question uh, for the panel. And uh, this is, uh, what issues uh, do you see as still remaining to be resolved uh, after this decision? Uh, you know, we've heard about the principle of setting global brand license terms. But that, of course, is only one aspect of these disputes. Uh, what do you believe still needs to be resolved most, most importantly? I, I think one of the, 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 the most important issues to still be resolved is the issue of what um, point in the, in the supply chain should SEP holders be uh, focusing on? Should, should they, you know, are there any restrictions to them focusing on the point that they want to focus on? I, which tends to be the OEM products at the end of the chain. Um, now, I, 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 um, I know that in Germany, there is looking like there's going to be a referral to uh, the CJU on this question, possibly in November, I understand, in the Daimler Nokia case. But um, it's certainly an issue that um, the UK courts, um, I, well, I look forward to uh, decisions on that in, in the future. Yes, um, I'd also add, um, well, I, I, I went through a few of the um, potential avenues that exist with forum non-convenience and indeed in the non-discriminatory um, aspect of the judgment, um, competition issues were mentioned which were never fully explored. The, these are things which may come up in the future. But one of the other real key things here, which it seems to be accepted by the UK courts at all levels, and I think is generally well known is that there is a, an issue with the actual system on declaration of SEPs and um, the fact that there are there's a, an over declaration practice. Um, the Supreme Court referred to seemed to accept the the this this position where the um, the SEP holder has to um, declare at a time where essentially the the standard is in chaos and no one will really know what the final standard will say and um whether or not their SEPs will be in true essential patents um the the the, the various commentary on this including from the eu commission has pointed to a need for um some kind of further analysis you know at a time when the when the standard is finalized and you know, it, it, this is something to look at in the future that um it should the SEP holder be giving more information, say, saying exactly which of its portfolio patents are true SEPs. Um, it, it's something that no doubt will be explored at, at all levels, not just in the courts, but but at the fundamental level with Etsy in the future. Um, what, one thing, just just John mentioning there, that um, re referring to Etsy, uh, one thing I'm intrigued to see what will happen in the future is in relation to um, other standard setting bodies, because you'll remember right at the beginning, I said that, that the fundamental basis in law for this decision is the contractual um, contractual position as between Etsy and the and the um, declaring set holder. Um, 
but of course, if you ground it so closely into a specific contractual provision in a specific standard setting organization's terms, then there's potential in future to look at divergence in, in terms of other set, um, other standard setting organizations, IEEE or SEN and SENELEC and, 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 and similar, um, and, and see uh, whether the courts will 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 just transpose the interpretation to the other um the other declarations whether there are differing terms within those other declarations that mean that that the basis on which the the, the court came to its decision here would not apply to those to those other decisions so that's i think something to to watch in future as 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 more and more cases um, are decided on the basis of this one <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and for myself, uh, just following on from both Will and John, uh, I think there is plenty more scope for competition law to be uh, looked at in the context of these negotiations. Uh, we've seen major cases where the implementers are generally in quite a strong negotiating position and certainly have a lot of financial resources. Uh, we could see with in the future with uh, development of the Internet of Things and 5G that we may be seeing much, much smaller companies being pursued by standard central patent holders with demands that they enter into licenses. And these smaller companies will be far less able to enter into a debate as to, well, is this a FRAND license offer or not? And I think in such circumstances, I, I could see the competition authorities imposing much stronger obligations on standard essential patent holders to be far more public in the terms that they offer uh, in order to ensure that they really are being fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory. That now brings us to the end of our webinar. I, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I hope you found it useful and enjoyable. Uh, please send us any further questions or comments. We would love to hear from you uh, after this webinar and uh, uh, we would very much look forward to seeing you on future Marks and Clark webinars uh, too. But for now, thank you once again and goodbye. Thank you very much.